So John, you recently released a book. It climbed to number one of all of Amazon's books. Crazy. It's number nine now on the New York Times bestseller, correct? Yeah. And what's the premise behind it? Well, it's called Imagine Heaven, Near-Death Experiences, God's Promises, and the Exhilarating Future that Awaits You. I've studied about a thousand near-death experiences where, you know, people die, but they're resuscitated, and they claim that they saw into the afterlife, that their consciousness continued on. And um, so I take uh, 120 of those experiences to show the commonalities between them. And then I also show how they actually uh, line up with the picture of heaven that the scriptures show us, uh, you know, what the Bible's always said. That's really interesting. I, I guess the biggest question that we have when we die is what happens when we die? What's the afterlife like? Well, and I, and I show the 12 commonalities that, that people uh, you know, in these experiences have, like, uh, we're still ourselves. Like they talk about how actually you're more yourself than you ever were. Like you come alive, not just with five senses, but they describe it like having 50 senses. Uh, like you, you, you feel, you see, you taste, you smell, but even beyond that, we, we know each other. So they recognize loved ones who have already died. You still have your memory from earth, but communication is pure. It's not, it's not just verbal like this. It's like full thought, heart to heart. Uh, they talk about beauty, not unlike that of earth, mountains and trees and forests and beautiful flowers, but experienced in other dimensions of time and space. A lot of them talk about the vibrant colors, like colors way beyond our color spectrum. And they're talking about something that really is beyond our, our three dimensions of space and our, our, you know, time is linear here, right? But Time there seems to be different. It, it's uh, for every moment of time we have here, there's infinite amount of time there. And they talk about how it's like that. What they experience, almost all of them say, this earth feels like the shadow. That feels like the real thing. And so it's really hard for many of them to come back, actually. I think the misconception, and I grew up with this, and I, I would say many in the scene that we work in is hell's where the party's at, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, and heaven is where you're on a cloud and you get to strum chords and sing songs all day. And it sounds boring exactly. to, to most of us. Exactly. But your research shows different? Yeah. In fact, what, and, and that's what I'm trying to show in Imagine Heaven, that no, everything you love about this life, you know, this is just a tiny taste. And by the way, everything we hate about this life, it's just a tiny taste. So we really are experiencing a, a shrunk down version of heaven and hell. And it's, it's our time of choosing. And you know, that's another thing that, that people commonly experience is uh, many, many experience this man of brilliant light, this being of light, as brighter than the sun, but they say not difficult to look at, instead just uh, radiating unconditional love and acceptance. And in his presence, they are known. This is a personal, they know he's God. He's a personal being. He knows each person and every thought, every motive, everything they've ever done. Those who know Jesus say is Jesus, but not everybody identifies him that way. But what they say consistently is that they never want to leave his presence because they've never been so loved. They've never been so known. They've never felt so at home. And uh, many times they'll, they'll experience a life review. So in his presence, he will, they will relive their lives. And again, time, time works in funky ways. So they, they'll say it was like in an instant, but at the same time, they re-experience every moment three-dimensionally, not just what they did or said, but they experience from another person's perspective how all their actions affected the, relationally the people around them. So they see the ripple effect of, of these kind, you know, acts of kindness that seem, you know, stupid to us, and yet they see how it had an impact and how it made that person feel, but also had a, had a ripple effect from person to person. And, and God is showing them that the things that often we think matter in this life are not what he's looking at. That, that love and, and those little acts of kindness actually have a ripple effect, and that's what he cares most about. And people consistently come back 
realizing that, you know, love is really what this is all about. You mentioned that they know it's God, but what about people from other cultures like, you know, India or the Middle East or people that are atheist or agnostic? And, you know, yeah. what, what is the research that, because you studied all accounts, not just Christian accounts. Yeah. Um, so what does the research show there? Well, yeah, so in Imagine Heaven, I focused in on accounts of people who didn't seem to need, like, to write a book to make money. Uh, so college professors and doctors and bank presidents and commercial airline pilots that, you know, making up stories like that would just hurt their credibility. But I also took a look at children and how what they said was consistent with adults uh, and with people from around the globe. One fascinating study that I point out was done with 500 Americans and 500 Indians and comparing their near-death experiences to, to, to try to take out any religious or cultural uh, bias in it. What you see is that they're all trying to describe something that is otherworldly. So it's kind of like, imagine, you know, us trying to describe to a flat, two-dimensional world of just black and white, what it's like being in three dimensions in color. That's like, you have to use black and white words to try to describe color. <laughs> it's really difficult. And um, even as I've interviewed them, they get frustrated at some point. They go, gosh, I, I, can't, I can't find the words. So their interpretations may be different, but what I start to show is that what they're describing is consistently the same. The Indians don't see the Vedic loci uh, of the Hindu heaven. Uh, they, they don't experience dissolution of, of the self into the impersonal Brahma, you know, the ultimate the ultimate form of, of, of God in, in, uh, in Indian culture. Consistently, or many of them see this brilliant man of light. They see uh, people with books of accounts. Uh, and Osis and Haroldson, who did this study, even note, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't match the typical things of the Hindu heaven, except maybe karma in the sense of these books of accounts that, that uh, show our good or bad deeds, that you know, basically we give an a, account for our lives. But what they miss is that that is actually uh, biblical. If you read the book of Revelation, there is the book of life, and there are these, these books, and, and, and for whatever reason, I don't know why, God seems to want to show us that every bit of our lives matter to Him. And you know, that, that freaks people out. People uh, fear that. I fear the judgment. Yeah, I guess. but uh, and I and I talk about that. How what the Bible talks about is there. There are two judgments, and this is neither of them. This life review. In fact, what people consistently experience is unconditional love, and and such compassion from God, and that He really gets them. He understands. And and I talk about how there there are two judgments talked about, and they don't happen till the end of history. So this is neither of them. The first one is, is simply um, whether we've accepted God's free gift of, of eternal life with Him. That's what he wants. he wants. He wants us to not fear judgment or condemnation at all. The second one is a reward ceremony. It, it, it's called judgment because it's, it's taken from the word the judges stand, like from the Greek Olympics. But it really is where people would go to get their gold or silver or medals or, you know, crowns in their day. And so it's really, God wants to reward us. And this is so encouraging because, you know, you think sometimes some of us have been through hell, right? I mean, we've been through stuff that God never intended. It's horrible. And when we take even that stuff that was horrible and we turn to him and we seek to follow him to make something good out of it and, and love rather than seek revenge or, or try to bless rather than curse, those things he sees, and those are the things that matter and get rewarded eternally. Now, what about the science behind it? Like, people would say they weren't really dead, or this is all just made up. How do we know that any of these accounts are even worth, you know, their weight yeah. in gold? Yeah. You know? So, I write a whole chapter on all these cardiologists and oncologists and doctors who didn't believe in life after death, and yet what they started to hear from their patients who were resuscitated convinced them. Uh, a guy is brought in, he had a heart, massive heart attack, he was brought in unconscious into the hospital, they removed his dentures so that he wouldn't choke, and they did CPR, you know, shock paddles, all that. 
Um, he stays in a coma. They move him out of that room into another room, and a week later he revives, and no one can find his dentures. And he is able to tell them exactly who is in the room, and the nurse that put his dentures in the bottom drawer of the crash cart, and they find his dentures. A woman in, in the hospital, she dies, and this one lady, when she's resuscitated, claimed that she moved out of that room of the hospital and up several floors in the hospital and saw a shoe on a ledge outside of a window. Uh, and so this, this nurse who heard her tell that went and searched all over on the, and, and finds this shoe out on a ledge where no idea even how it got out there or how you would get it there. You couldn't just put it there. And she had never been there. She'd never been there. <sighs> Uh, now I know not everybody's had a great experience and we're going to we're going to cut to a clip where you interview Howard Storm who is an atheist professor who kind of had some scary um instances. Yeah, and this is an important thing I write about is that um you, you know many people initially, you know, they feel great, they feel more alive than ever. They they meet people that seem nice, you know, or maybe even people they recognize. But Howard Storm, his account is important because it begins like that, but it doesn't end like that. I just felt the worst I'd ever felt in my entire life. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't breathe, and now I'm like Superman. <laughs> and my eyesight, my hearing, my taste, my smell. So, so you still don't know you're dead? No. And you feel I haven't figured alive? This out. You feel I feel good? more alive than I've ever felt in my entire life. I heard people calling me um, in English kind of nicely, you know, Howard. Howard, come here, come here. Now, as I ask them questions like, where are we going, how much further, things like that, they started to become more rude and say things to me like, shut up. So I'm like trying to fend them off by punching and um, slamming them, and they're pulling and tugging at me. And at first it was pushing, kicking, pulling, hitting, and then that became biting and tearing with their fingernails and hands. The emotional pain of what they had done to me was worse than the physical pain. The, the physical pain was pain from head to foot, just solid, horrible, acute pain on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 total. Didn't begin to match what I felt on the inside was, you know, um, having been taken down to nothing. I mean, the worst things that you could possibly imagine had happened to me. And about 23% of people who have had near-death experiences have had what's, what are called hellish near-death experiences. So I write a chapter on that to help us understand, well, what does that mean and how can we know that's not going to be our destination because it's not a keg party. <laughs> what about those of us that have just struggled and faced those hellish circumstances here on earth and we want to give up because heaven sounds so great and we don't feel like we have any purpose here on this earth. Like if, if it's as great as you, you make it out to be, then what's to stop us? Well, yeah, and suicide, I'll tell you, is never the solution. And I talk about some people who, uh, who had near-death experiences in a suicide attempt and all of them come back saying that was not a good idea. The thing to realize is that God has us here for a purpose. And, and this life, though it seems long, it's short. Part of it is that even when we go through horrible things, it doesn't mean those were God's will. We have free will. And that's what people realize is we really do have choices. We have choices that, that affect us and that affect others. And people have made choices that have hurt us, but we can make choices to even take those things that have hurt us and reach out to others who are being hurt and comfort them and care about them. And that in doing that, we actually make something good out of this horrible thing. God knows our hearts and our motives and our thoughts, and many times that's what matters most to Him. It's simpler than we make it, like Jesus said. You know, He doesn't want us to worry about all these things that we get all bent out of shape about. He wants us to know that God loves us more than we can possibly imagine because he created us for himself. It's like we feel about our kids. It's like they don't have to earn our love. They're our kids. That's what he wants us to understand. And then we can follow him 
to love others as much as he loves us. And that's a process. Uh, but he does have a purpose for every single person here. The book is Imagine Heaven. Thank you, John Burke. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. <laughs>